somebody said that it's not the things that I don't understand in the Bible that cause me difficulty. It's the things that I do understand. And sometimes we find that to be very true, don't we? If we could only put into practice the things that we do understand in the Bible, then the things that we don't understand, they would kind of pale into insignificance. Uh, the passage we're about to read today are the words of Jesus again in the Sermon on the Mount. And they're quite a straightforward, apparently, passage, bit of teaching that Jesus is giving. But what is difficult is putting it into practice. And that really is where the rubber hits the road, isn't it? As far as following Jesus is concerned, is being able to put his teaching into practice. The problem is, the passage we're about to read today, so many of the things that Jesus says seem to fly right in the face of what our ordinary human nature would want to do. And so that's what we're going to be thinking about today. So we're in Matthew chapter 5, reading from verse 33 up to 48. Matthew chapter 5, beginning at 33. Again, you have heard that it was said to those of old, You shall not swear falsely, but shall perform to the Lord what you have sworn. But I say to you, do not take an oath at all, either by heaven, for it is the throne of God, or by the earth, for it is his footstool, or by Jerusalem, for it is the city of the great king. And do not take an oath by your head, for you cannot make one hair white or black. Let what you say be simply yes or no. Anything more than this comes from evil. You have heard that it was said, an eye for an eye and a tooth for a tooth. But I say to you, do not resist the one who is evil. But if anyone slaps you on the right cheek, turn to him the other also. And if anyone would sue you and take your tunic, let him have your cloak as well. And if anyone forces you to go with him one mile, go with him two miles. Give to the one who begs from you and do not refuse the one who would borrow from you. You have heard that it was said, you shall love your neighbor and hate your enemy. But I say to you, love your enemies and pray for those who persecute you so that you may be sons of your father who is in heaven. For he makes his sun rise on the evil and on the good and sends rain on the just and on the unjust. For if you love those who love you, what rewards do you have? Do not even the tax collectors do the same? And if you greet only your brothers, what more are you than others? Do not even the Gentiles do the same? You therefore must be perfect as your heavenly Father is perfect. Amen. In elections and in the newspapers and the media in general, people like to deal in sound bites, don't they? Uh, and these can be wee sort of pithy sayings which tell part of the story but don't maybe tell the whole thing and you have to dig a bit deeper to find out exactly what they mean. But somehow they get the headlines. And uh, so people like to focus on that sort of thing. Well, we're not the same in the Christian faith. Sometimes we deal a little bit in sound bites as well. And uh, here's one that is used sometimes. Jesus didn't come to set up a religion, but a rescue. And there's a lot of truth in that. If what we mean by religion is rules and regulations that people have to follow and rites and ceremonies that people have to go through. If that's what we mean by religion, then this is absolutely correct. Because Jesus didn't come to establish a different set of rules and regulations for people to live by, but he came to rescue us from the consequences of our own rule keeping and trying to live our own way. 
The problem is you remember, because we're going through the Sermon on the Mount, the problem is you remember is that the Pharisees did think that he had come to do away with their faith, the rules and the regulations that they were putting in place and that they thought they had to keep. And so Jesus said to them, back in chapter 5, verse 17, Do not think that I have come to abolish the law or the prophets. I have not come to abolish them, but to fulfill them. And we know that he fulfilled the Old Testament in his life and that he lived a perfect life, life that never did anything outside of God's will and purposes. But he also fulfilled the Old Testament law and prophets in that he fulfilled God's plan that was working its way through the Old Testament law and prophets to send a rescuer. And Jesus was that rescuer. He fulfilled that plan of God. And so Jesus says, don't think I've come to abolish that. I've come to fulfill them. So that was his defense. But then Jesus went on the offense and he said this. He said, I tell you that unless your righteousness exceeds that of the scribes and Pharisees, you will never enter the kingdom of heaven. Now that was true in two ways. A, they'd got their standards completely wrong, and we're going to come back to that in a minute. But B, we could never keep these standards anyway. Jesus came to be a rescuer because we could never have kept up to even the standards that the Pharisees were seeking to impose on people. In fact, the whole purpose of the law, one of Jesus' followers said this, he said, by the works of the law, no human being will be justified in God's sight. Nobody can make themselves deserving of heaven in God's sight just by keeping rules and regulations. Since through the law comes the knowledge of sin. And in giving the Old Testament law, one of God's purposes was that we might know <laughs> that we'd failed that we might know that we couldn't succeed no matter how hard we tried to be perfect we couldn't manage it and therefore we needed a saviour we needed to be able to cast ourselves on the mercy of God and know the forgiveness that he provided for us in Jesus that was the purpose that, uh, in Galatians it tells us that the law was like a guardian or a tutor or a school teacher to bring us to Jesus well, the Pharisees, of course, they didn't get the gist of that at all. And they thought that just by keeping their rules and regulations, they could make themselves deserving of the kingdom of heaven. I don't know whether anybody has ever fancied trying pole vaulting. It looks kind of graceful when it all works. And the thought of sailing through the air, you know, that enormous height, just kind of probably is quite appealing to a lot of people. It um, actually doesn't appeal to me an enormous amount. I always kind of sort of imagine what happens if that pole breaks. Not too bad if it breaks when you're like that, standing on the ground. But imagine if it breaks when you're like that there. That just... It boggles my mind. Don't know whether this person got over or not. But here we are back with our original picture. The, the world record for the pole vault, by the way, 6.03 metres, that's 19 feet 9 and a quarter inches. Diego Braz da Silva in 2016, it's maybe been passed by now. Uh, the female world record is 5.05 meters. The way the pole vault competition in the Olympics certainly works is this. The, the, the bar starts at a fairly low level, well maybe not to us, but for them a lowish level and it moves up and competitors are allowed to enter at any height that they want and they're allowed to pass at any height that they want but if they have three consecutive fails at a height or at adjacent heights, three 
consecutive fails, then they're eliminated from the competition. So what some of the better jumpers do, better vaulters do, is that they wait and they don't enter into the competition at the lower levels. They wait until the bar gets high before they start to try to vault it. Jesus is saying to the Pharisees here, you set your bar too low. And Jesus is putting the bar up and saying that, you know, God doesn't want you to be just jumping this low bar here. God's standard is much higher. He wants you to come in at that higher height. And so we've seen that Jesus talked about murder, that it's not just enough to say, well, I haven't actually murdered anyone, when you have had a contemptuous anger against them in your heart. Jesus says it's not just enough not to have committed adultery. If you've been lusting after somebody in your heart, put the bar up there. God's standard is much, much higher. And then he talked about divorce. And the Pharisees had said, well, <coughs> divorce is allowed, so any reason at all will be okay as long as we go through the legal formalities. Yeah, divorce is all right. Jesus says, no, that's the low bar. God allowed divorce because of the hardness of your heart. The bar is a way up there. In extreme, exceptional circumstances, God tolerated divorce. It was the lesser of two evils. But you put the bar away down low. And today he's moving on. And he's doing something very, very similar. As he talks about oaths. Now that's not using bad language or cursing or whatever. That is making a promise or swearing that something is true, alleging that something is true at all sorts of different levels. It, it, do you like listening to little children when they're playing? It's absolutely great, isn't it? You just tune into their conversation and the, the wee conversations that they have with one another are just absolutely wonderful if you hear them talking. But the sort of thing you hear them saying in the playground is, you know, one says to the other, my daddy's taking me to Barbados in the summer. And the other one says, no way he's not. And she says, yes he is, I promise. And the other one says, he can't be taking you to Barbados. He says, he is. Brownie's honour he's taking me to Barbados. No he can't, your dad doesn't have a job just now, he'll not have enough money. Yes, he is. Cross my heart and hope to die. He's taking me to Barbados. And you see what they're, what they're doing. They're upping the ante all the time, making these different assertions about how our dad's taking it to Barbados. Kids are wonderful if they do that. The Pharisees were doing something very similar. They knew they had to tell the truth. They had to not make false promises or false allegations. But then they had a whole series of different levels of how serious they could be about something that they were saying. You'll notice that Jesus says to them there, Do not swear by heaven, for it is the throne of God, or by the earth, for it is his footstool, or by Jerusalem, for it is the city of the great king. And do not take an oath by your head, for you cannot, I guess that might mean by their life, for you cannot make one hair uh, white or black. They had different degrees of seriousness by which to reckon things were being said. So what they were really doing was they were kind of being devious and making excuses for breaking their word or for saying something that wasn't true because, well, after all, that's not as serious as if I'd if sworn by the temple or that's not as serious as if I'd sworn by heaven. They were being devious, they were being uh, underhand in what they were doing in order to wriggle out of an awkward situation. <coughs> Let's be honest, it's awful easy to do that, isn't it? It's awful easy for us to, to say we'll do something and then afterwards to regret that and to try to find ways of wriggling out of that situation. 
Well, I just got carried away in the spur of the moment when I said that. Well, I didn't actually promise <coughs> that I would do it. Well, after all, they've let me down in the past. I'm sure we've all thought things like that to try to get ourselves out of something that we've said. Jesus said, don't have this low bar of ways of getting out of what you've said. Set the bar high. When you say yes, mean it. When you say no, mean it. That should be enough. And then he moves on to when others do things to us. This bit about oaths, that's kind of under our own control. That we can say something or not say something. We can promise something or not promise something. That's entirely at our own control. But the next wee section here is when somebody does something to us, so it's outside of our control, how do we react to that situation? It's awful easy to overreact, isn't it? You're on the football field, somebody barges into you, unfairly you think, but the referee doesn't do anything about it. So I'm going to get them back. That's what comes into your head, isn't it? I'm going to show them who's in charge. I'm going to show them. Who, and next time they've got the ball, you're after them, sliding tackle, take their feet right out from underneath them, crash them down on the ground. It's a total overreaction. But it's a human reaction, isn't it? When things go against us, to overreact in that way. The Old Testament had laws that were there in order to govern justice as it was put out. The punishment had to match the crime. It wasn't to be uh, different. It wasn't to be variable. It was to match the crime. So an eye for an eye and a tooth for a tooth. But what Jesus is saying is set the bar higher. Jesus is saying show grace to somebody who has wronged you. If somebody slapped you on the face, says Jesus, diffuse the situation by turning the other cheek. Now I'm sure he's not talking about you know, grievous bodily harm. I'm sure he's not talking about domestic abuse or any of that sort of situation at all or something you know, it is, it is a totally different ball game altogether. The Bible tells us quite clearly that government in a country is there to keep order, that there are laws and, and there are authorities that, that these things should be dealt with by. But what Jesus is talking about here is somebody slaps you in the face. It could be metaphorical or it could be literal. And you turn the other cheek. You diffuse the situation by not overreacting, not responding in the way that our human reactions would want to respond. Then he talks about if somebody is suing you, presumably you've done something wrong. Somebody is suing you for your tunic. Jesus says, don't just get off with the bare minimum. Don't try to, to screw them down. Don't try to dodge out of it. He says, give them your cloak as well. Be generous. If you've, somebody's got something against you and you're su they're suing you for your tuning, you give them your cloak as well. Same if somebody asks you to go a mile with them, Jesus says go to. I'm guessing that could probably be an employer asking you to do something <laughs> or that could be a soldier in this case here asking somebody to carry a burden or whatever. Jesus says show willing, do more than just the minimum to get off with it. Finally, he says, help those that need your help. Don't just ignore them and walk past them. And then he says, love your enemies. Not be in love with your enemies, that would be silly, but love your enemies. Care about them. Pray for them. That's an immensely practical suggestion, isn't it? If your neighbour has fallen out with you, if your work colleague is always annoying you, rubbing you up the wrong way, if 
you're having a personality clash with somebody at church pray for them it's so hard for the the resentment to continue isn't it if you pray for them and that will work the situation through and Jesus says love your enemies pray for them and he gives us a reason to do all of that he says that you may be children of your father in heaven for he makes his sun rise on the evil and the good and sends rain on the just and the unjust children pick up an awful lot don't they from role models that's why it's so good for children to have a mother and a father who are good role models for them because they learn so much more about character about attitude about about morals about how to go about living from the role models that they see round about them day by day schools do their best uh, it used to be called religious and moral education i'm not sure what it's called now maybe you can, you can tell me later but to teach these sort of things and to inculcate these sort of at good attitudes in young people at school but these things get forgotten when they're out on a Friday night with their mates. The schools try to teach them about you know, diet and home economics, you know, about calories and about cholesterol and about vitamins and so on. But when the lunch bell rings, they're up the street to the bakers and they're in for a sausage roll or for some chips or whatever it is. They learn less in a structured environment than they do seeing it modelled, seeing it exemplified in life. And, and, and being a parent is the most important job that there is so role modeling to children is, is a great thing so that you may be children of your father in heaven says Jesus because he makes his son rise on the evil and the good and he sends rain on the just and the unjust God has a common grace towards everybody not just to those who are friendly towards him but to everybody he showers his blessings on them not because they have earned it or deserved it but because he is that kind of God again one of Jesus followers says this that God demonstrates his own love for us in this while we were still sinners Christ died for us Romans 5 verse 8 God didn't wait for us to be perfect before he sent Jesus to rescue us God loved us before he loved us while we were still sinners and sent Jesus to die on the cross for us that is his example of how we should love and that is setting the bar so high isn't it Jesus worked that out in his life as well all these things that we read here that Jesus taught he worked out in his life giving us an example that we should follow Jesus says love your enemies do you remember him on the cross saying, Father, forgive them. They don't know what they're doing. Jesus told us to turn the other cheek. When he was threatened, he didn't threaten people back. When people called him names, he didn't call them names back. Jesus told people to go the other mile. He went as far as anybody could go in laying down his life for us. He gives eternal life to those who ask what more giving could you ask for than that and Jesus keeps his promises his promises are not conditional on how we behave he did in life and he will do in the future Jesus exemplified all of this teaching that's here so I guess back to where we came in at the start sometimes it's the things that we do understand in the Bible that we find most difficult not the things that we don't understand 
These are difficult teachings to put into practice. But we need to try to put them into practice because that's where God has put the bar. That's his standard that we seek, should seek to be living at. Not a way down here like the Pharisees were, keeping rules and regulations. But a way up here. Not to earn our salvation. Because Jesus has earned it for us and offers it to us as a free gift. But in order to show our gratitude to him. And in order to be children of our Father in heaven.